Hey everyone, John Lorden here. Welcome to the 10th episode of Crime After Crime. And with me as always is the lovely and talented... Danielle Hallen. <laughs> as dramatic as possible. <laughs> yeah, I like how you took it low there. <laughs> We are so happy to have you back here with us um, for another fun episode. I love recording these episodes. I always have such a good time hanging out with Danielle. Um, But it seems like some of you are starting to love these episodes as well. We had our numbers double all of a sudden this year, and we're, we're talking about it. We're not even quite sure how it happened, but somewhere between February and March, the audience literally doubled on the podcast. So we wanted to just give you guys a very big thank you from us for telling your friends and telling your family. Obviously that blurb I do at the end of every episode is helping. (laughs) Um, It sure is. I know I was checking into the numbers and at first I thought I was reading it wrong and I went back almost to every single month and I was like, huh, interesting. Okay. So I'm not seeing things. (laughs) Yeah. It's pretty awesome. It's an awesome feeling that you guys are enjoying this. Yeah. And it was such a weird thing because our numbers were like stable and yeah. then they just doubled and now they're stable again. But it's it's not like a gradual growth that happened. It was just like all of a sudden at the start of the year, you guys just all came out and said, hey, we're going to tell our friends about it. I, I really don't know. <laughs> yep. Or or if someone shouted us out, let us know so we can thank them. <laughs> yeah, I kind of feel like that might have happened. I don't know who it would have been, but um, I do feel like there's a chance that someone did a shout out for us and we just haven't heard about it yet. Uh, on top of that. I saw that there was this little list of the top podcasts, true crime podcasts at a website called Ranker, and they didn't have crime after crime on there. So I was like, you know what? I, I got to add crime after crime. So clearly something is wrong here. Yeah. <laughs> Someone messed up. <laughs> yeah. So I took the time, I added crime after crime, and then I tweeted about it. And you guys were so awesome. Um, I was literally watching it like every hour after that and the number was growing and growing and it was really quick where all of a sudden we had popped to number one. So yeah, once again, we have to give you guys a very, very big thank you. And I think we might still be at number one. I just wanted us to be on the list and, you know, like get, get a couple votes there. So maybe, you know, we're not right at the bottom, but you guys went way over the top with that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And it's pretty cool because I feel like me and you stumble on Ranker a lot while looking for these cases. Yeah. So it's it's pretty cool to see that. Yeah. Ranker is a a fun website when it comes to lists. And Mm -hmm. as a matter of fact, for the extra stories that we tell at the end, pretty frequently one blurb might be from Ranker. Um, For today's episode, I've got three blurbs, all of them from Ranker specifically. I wanted to pay tribute to Ranker on today's episode. So we're going to do that. But you guys should check them out, especially if you're if you're into lists. They do a lot of really good work with um, pulling together a bunch of fun little tidbits for you. And of course, we are gearing up for CrimeCon. We're going to be there in a matter of days, Danielle. I know it doesn't feel real. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to have to message you the night before and be like, "Um, I forgot it's tomorrow. I probably should pack." <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I'm telling I, you now. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it came out of nowhere. I feel like I was planning it for months and months and months and all of a sudden I was like, "Wait a minute." Yeah. That's next week. <laughs> I yeah. should probably get myself together. <laughs> yeah, there's been a lot of planning. Um, that's one thing I'm looking forward to is my office has just been filled with boxes of all this different stuff I've been ordering up for giveaways. You know, we've got the crime after crime stress ball. We've got the crime after crime magnet. We've got the crime after crime picks that will be signed, signing and giving to people. I've got three men in a mystery magnets. I've got Lord and Art stuff, including a new pen. Everyone's going to want. I'm pretty sure. I'm hearing good things about it so far. Um, so, yeah, my office right now is just filled with boxes. And that's one benefit to CrimeCon happening is I'll get some space back in here. But we hope that many of you will be there. And if you are, please be sure to come by. Please be sure to stop by and see us so we can give you some of this stuff. You want some free stuff, don't you? I do. And I am speaking for myself. <laughs> yeah, be sure to grab it. I really do. <laughs> yeah, and I'm bringing you a brain scratch pen. Do not give it away this time. I'm not, and I still blame that on Pal. Pal gives away all my cool stuff. <laughs> I'll give him another pen if he wants to. All right. Well, uh, just to remind everyone, you can vote on the Crime After Crime episodes at our Twitter account, at Crime After Pod, and you can vote there for seven days after the episode has posted 
And you guys can also vote on YouTube. All you have to do is if you're on mobile, click the screen and a little I, like the letter I will appear in the corner. Or if you're on a laptop, it's pretty much the same thing. Just hover your mouse over and you can vote right there for who you think should win the craziest story brought forward. That's right. And now we're moving on to voting results. I'm gonna take it low with Danielle. <laughs> All right, you guys, we did murdering mother-in-laws last month. That was very interesting. Uh, you guys seem to like the topic, staying, you know, right in there with Mother's Day. So for Twitter, 35% of you guys voted for me and 65% voted for John. Y'all, he blew me out of the water. Thank you, Twitter <laughs> and friends. Then on YouTube, it was even worse. I only had 22% and John had 77. So John... You have officially won five times. I've won four. Here is your coffee cup. Oh, I'm passing it over. All right. Well, I've got it. And once again, I blew the hand off of the coffee cup, which I'm getting really good at. I'm getting really good at screwing that up. Thank you. Um, and for my acceptance speech, I would like to, get, to give a very big thank you to Ma Duncan. She was wild. Yeah. Without her crazy, maniacal story, I definitely wouldn't have won last month. I could not believe that one. I've told it to almost every single person that I know at this point. Yeah. <laughs> because it was so unbelievable. Yeah. I was interviewed on a podcast and I, I had to bring it back up. I was like, you guys got to hear about this one. Uh, thank you guys so much for the votes. I really appreciate it. And what are the totals, Danielle? I've won four times. You have won five. Ooh. So here I am. I'm here to take it back. All right. Episode 10. That's what we're getting into now. And that is disorderly dads. We got Father's Day coming up this month. So we figured we'd follow in the trend disorderly dads. But we're not looking specifically for disorderly conduct charges. We're looking for dads that may be criminals or helping to raise criminals. So, but Danielle had a little feedback on the disorderly conduct stuff, right? You learned some new stuff yes. there? Yes. Well, I feel like we all hear about disorderly conduct charges, but it, I feel like it's one of those things where you hear it so often that you don't really think much into it. And when I was just doing a little bit of research, I realized what a broad kind of blanket charge disorderly conduct was that I, I don't think I realized it before doing my research. You can pretty much do anything that's just kind of unruly behavior out in public. It's almost like if you commit a crime that doesn't fit into other more serious charges or specific charges, you can get disorderly conduct. Wow. I feel like I saw so many different types of crimes and I feel like authorities are like, oh, well, we can't charge them with theft. We can't charge them with this. So we'll just, you know, Slap disorderly conduct on there. Almost like a catch-all, huh? <laughs> exactly. That's what it seemed like. And I just, I found that very, very interesting. I don't think I had really thought about that prior to doing all of my research. So I just kind of wanted to share it with everybody because even, you know, working in this field for so long, you know, going and researching and looking into different cases, sometimes I feel like I still don't have a full understanding Kind of the same thing with the alibi from the one case a while back. Yeah. Learning things all the time, every step of the way. It almost sounds like we should take that on as a topic, <clears throat> like the you know craziest disorderly conduct charge or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, there's something to that. <clears throat> hmm. Stay tuned. Coming up in a future episode. <laughs> All right. Well, so we did it. We both brought our stories about disorderly dads. We are now going to start with Danielle's, and I cannot wait to hear this one. I know, you guys, this took me, this took me a lot, okay? <laughs> this story <laughs> took the life out of me for like a week, but I found a great one and I'm here to share it with you guys. So fathers are supposed to be the ones that protect you from all things dangerous. They encourage you to walk on the right path in life. But this father instead used his daughter for his own criminal benefit. So on March 19th of 1985, 23-year-old Linda Brown was found dead in her bed with two bullet wounds in her chest. It was clearly a homicide, and only hours later, 14-year-old Cinnamon Brown was found curled in a fetal position in a dog house behind the Garden Grove, California home. She was covered in sweat, her own urine and vomit, and it appeared that she had taken a cocktail of different drugs, and she had a note in her hand that she was holding very tightly that read, Dear God, please forgive me, I didn't mean to hurt her. 
Uh huh. Mm. <clears throat> We're getting there. So after questioning the family, it was clear from Cinnamon's dad and Linda's sister Patty that there was tension between Cinnamon and her stepmom lately. But everyone else knew that knew the family said the relationship was fine. But despite these contradictory statements, Cinnamon was arrested and charged for Linda's murder. So this 14 year old girl was arrested and charged for her stepmom's murder. In September of 1986, Cinnamon was found guilty and was sentenced to 27 to life in prison. For a stay at the California Youth Authority, she was initially very calm. She worked a computer job. She practiced needlepoint, and she refused to really speak about the murder. And the most she would really say about it was that she didn't remember a single thing. She always kind of brushed it off saying, oh, don't remember. Don't know why I did it. I don't know anything. And people really started to question if she was actually responsible for this murder. Her demeanor and her reaction just didn't match up to someone capable of this kind of crime. And an investigator that had been on the case himself agreed that something was wrong. So even after Cinnamon was sentenced, he kept on digging because he believed that Sweet Cinnamon wasn't fully responsible, but he was questioning her dad instead. Mm, Wow. After three years of searching for answers, the truth finally came out and it is a wild ride. So 36-year-old David Brown, Cinnamon's dad and Linda's husband, appeared to be a typical family man. He had a great business. He was an absolute computer whiz. But after Cinnamon was incarcerated, his visit to his daughter that he claimed to love so much became less and less frequent. And Cinnamon's calm behavior turned angry. And when she finally spoke to this investigator trying to get to the truth, he learned she learned why her dad wasn't visiting. Cinnamon's dad was busy living it up thanks to his newfound wealth that he received from, drum roll, you guessed it, Linda's life insurance policy. Almost $1 million. Wow. Wow. Now, this in itself isn't too strange. Life insurance policies are paid out frequently, but that's not necessarily the worst part. Before Cinnamon's trial had even ended, and without her knowledge, David married Patty. Linda's teenage sister. So the dad married his dead wife's little sister. That was a teenager. He's 36. So his former sister-in-law. Oh, it's super confusing. I know there's a lot of people involved. Yes. Okay. So they went on to live in a beautiful house. They had a whole fleet of fancy cars. And something about this made Cinnamon snap. So she finally told the investigator what really happened. And she agreed to get her dad's confession on tape. So through a deeper look into David's life, it wasn't the stable one that he pretended it was. He actually had been married six times. None of the wives seemed to last very long. They were always much younger than he was. And he had met Linda, his ex-dead wife, originally as a neighbor. She had lived with her single mother and 10 siblings, including Patty, his new wife, and her younger sister. Wow. So he had actually told all of the children and the single mom that he had cancer. Now, he did suffer from many illnesses and health issues, and he was constantly taking medications, but he did not have cancer, and he was a known hypochondriac, so there's no telling which of those illnesses actually were real, but he basically used that as a way to convince all of the daughters in the family to come and help him keep his house tidy during the week. So he basically faked being this fatherly figure to multiple children, including his own by lying to them, to get them to do all of his chores. And this allowed him to form a relationship with Linda. So after a while, David and Linda ended up getting married. They divorced once. They remarried again. And this is where they finally moved to Garden Grove, where Linda, David, Cinnamon, and Patty lived. This is kind of when Patty comes more into the picture. Patty had apparently asked Linda, her sister, if she could live with them because the chaos of their large family was really starting to get to her. So David basically took her in. She's this young teenager. He played a fatherly role yet again, but he also took advantage of her emotional fragility. Yeah. Within three years of living together, David began to try and convince Cinnamon and Patty that Linda, his wife, and her twin brother were planning a way to kill him for his money. Mm. So he's making up all these stories. He's saying, you know, to his daughter and Patty, his future wife, it's strange to say. He's telling them all these, all these terrible things, and he used their weak spots to manipulate them. Patty, this poor girl, was starved for attention after growing up in such a large, chaotic home with a single parent. 
Um, so he actually ended up beginning a sexual relationship with her in hopes of gaining her trust that way. And then Cinnamon, on the other hand, was his daughter and he knew she would pretty much do anything for him. And he told her that he was too ill. He was too weak. He couldn't carry out this task on his own. You know, he was basically telling her, you know, I'm relying on you. And he would tell both the girls over and over again, if you really loved me, you would do this for me. And he finally successfully convinced them that the only way to keep him alive was to kill his enemies before they had a chance to kill him. Wow. So, you know, these are teenage girls. I'm not exactly sure how old Patty was at the time, but I do know Cinnamon was only 14 years old. Yeah. Yeah. So next they had to pick who would carry out the murder. And since both Cinnamon and Patty were teenagers... You know, he figured since they were young, both of them would likely be fine. But he told Cinnamon, since she was only 14, she had to be the one to do it because she would be sentenced the least because of her age. He reassured her all kinds of things. He told her that all she would have to do would be see a psychiatrist. You know, he's like, you know, carry out this murder, protect me, lie for me. And I promise you there's not going to be any prison time. You're too young. And, you know, you, you usually trust your father. So she went along with it. So after months of planning on that early morning, David went in and woke Cinnamon and Patty up and he handed Cinnamon a handful of pills, ordered her to take them and then handed her a revolver and sent her into Linda's room. On the instructions of her own father, she then shot Linda two times, killing her. David, in an attempt to have an alibi, went to a local store and was wandering around shopping knowing very well that the medication that he had just given his daughter after telling her to kill his wife was going to kill her. And to cover the step to make sure she was the one pinned for his wife's murder, he tied a ribbon with a note around her wrist, making it clear she was the one that was responsible for the crime. Wow. So that note wasn't even cinnamon, it was her dad. Being so young and naive, she kept guarding their secret. So, you know, basically she was found. They were able to, you know, clean her up, take her to the hospital. Uh, but she kept lying for him. She kept protecting a secret because thanks to his brainwashing and manipulation, she thought she was doing what she was supposed to be doing. You know, her father was telling her, this is okay. You'll be fine. We had to do this. You didn't have a choice. Well, he and also it, made her an accomplice. I mean. Exactly. Yeah. He. He, he gave her no choice in every way possible. Right. And it wasn't until the investigator told her that her father and her accomplice were now living the dream thanks to her crime that she realized that she had been tricked. There was never any threat. His life was never in any danger. He just needed someone to carry out his dirty deeds. And authorities have said that if Cinnamon had not vomited while she was in that doghouse after taking all the pills, she likely wouldn't be here to tell the truth and he would be out free. Wow. So Patty also ended up you know, catching on to his manipulation and she also came forward to help make sure the truth came out. And in September of 1988, David went before a judge and faced the testimonies from the two people he had forced into compliance. David Brown ended up getting arrested and he was thrown in jail to await his own trial, being charged with first degree murder, but not without attempting more manipulation first. He started to blame Patty for the entire scheme, saying she wanted her sister out of the way to be with him. He even tried to pay a fellow inmate to kill Patty and two members of the DA office. But at this point, authorities knew his tricks. So this person he was trying to pay was actually an undercover cop. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so he went on trial in 1990, ended up with a sentence of life in prison. Patty also ended up going on trial, but she only spent a handful of years in prison and then went on to marry a prison guard once released. <laughs> Cinnamon ended up being released in 1992 and tried to continue on living her life as normal as possible. And then David ended up dying of natural causes March 2014. Wow. So this dad, I mean was already dragging his daughter along multiple failed marriages you know not showing her the most stable life and using people her. left and right <clears throat> yep and then tricked her into killing someone for him wow wow yep sounds like a terrible terrible man um i just i can't believe just the way that he was manipulating people, even at the start for him just to you know, have someone to clean up after him. And then exactly. It's like he used this fatherly figure role. Yeah. To really manipulate everyone. And then it makes me wonder about all of his previous marriages as well with younger women. Right. 
Right. You know, he he seemed to understand there is a slight, you know, weakness there sometimes. And, you know, he saw this family that didn't have a father figure. I, oh, it's just, it, oh, it gives me the heebie-jeebies. I've got goosebumps. You know, he even was really being terrible to people he was not the biological father of. Yeah. Yeah. Even if you remove the the, the actual crime from this story, mm-hmm. it's still just a terrible story. Mm-hmm. I mean, the fact that he would marry his former sister-in-law, his wife's younger sister, especially after she had been living in the house uh, through teenage years. It just makes you wonder what the heck was going on during all that. I mean, you know, now we're talking about grooming and just a whole Mm -hmm. other level to being able to manipulate someone starting at a very young age and then use those hooks as they get older, you know, for them to be part of this crime in some way as well. Yep. And just what a terrible thing for Cinnamon to realize what her father had done and to know that she was literally, she was targeted as well. You know, exactly. He he was going to make it look like a a murder suicide effectively. And it just, it didn't play out the way that he had planned. Mm hmm. Wow. Yep, he's a mess. There's actually, uh, I think, two books on it as well by Anne Rule. There's one that's called If You Love Me or If You Really Love Me, and then one called A Killing in the Family. So it, it must go much, much deeper than just this very brief yeah. story, which scares me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 I don't know that that would be the easiest read with the type of stuff that we're hearing just in this version of it. But uh, no. any updates on what happened to Cinnamon? Did she get her life together? Um, Unfortunately, she, well, she did get married, but yeah. unfortunately, her husband ended up ending his life mm. at some point. So she just hasn't had the easiest time here on Earth. No. <laughs> um, And then I can't see much past that. It was actually a really publicized case. It was a pretty large one. And so, you know, right when she got out, there were obviously people who believed she still should be in there because she technically was the one who acted it out. I mean, she was kind of attacked right off the bat coming out of prison um, because a lot of people still didn't agree with it. So I... I have no idea how she is today. That was the latest update that I saw, but I just think it's really unfortunate. And you know, it's it's scary. It's one of those things where you know, everyone has a very different opinion on if your age should get you out of a crime you have committed. Sure, sure. Um, and I feel like she's kind of falling in a very scary category to where she did do it, but at the same time, you have to understand someone's you know, mental capacity to understand what they might be doing and the manipulation from an outside source. It's just a whole mess. I feel terrible for the whole situation. How old was she when when the crime actually happened? 14. 14 when it happened. Yeah. And you also have to consider this is this is not a manipulation that was just happening over a few months leading up to this. Absolutely not. This is someone that, you know, we all trust our parents. We we learned so much about the world through them. And with him being this type of manipulator in terms of the other women in his life, I'm sure that he was doing the same thing with her, uh, essentially, you know, prepping her to do whatever he would want. If that was as simple as making sure that, you know, she was going to clean up the house because he was going to play a guilt game about, I can't because of all these diseases I'm struggling with yeah, or taking it this far, um, which obviously is an extreme, but she was obviously conditioned in some way to accept that because she did roll with it. And if nothing else, I think we can look at a case like that and say, you know, she is a minor at this point. So it's not the same as being tried as an adult. So while while there should be a sentence of some kind, they typically are shorter sentences or they have a lot more to do with rehabilitation um, and, and trying to make these functional members of society. But and she was in a youth program, so you know maybe there maybe there was something going on there. I know she worked. I know she you know did a lot of different crafting type of things. So I feel like maybe there was some structure there that helped her a lot. But yeah, it's, it's yeah rough. yeah. But you know it does those types of things that we learn from our family when we're that young. I mean they just it sets us up for how we exactly. go into the future and. Um, I think it's terrible that she had the outcome she did in her marriage, but I can't really say I'm surprised. She might have been kind of engineered at this point to seek out people that might be, you know, a, a little yeah. risky in terms of their behavior or or maybe she's trying to save other people and that put her in that situation as well. Um, yep. Because obviously she probably had a little bit of like a caretaker 
type mentality based on the stuff oh, that yeah. her father was was gearing. You know, because there's no telling what was happening before he met this family of 10 children. You know, I'm sure it was just Cinnamon and just David. And I'm sure he had her doing everything she possibly could. I have seen nothing about her mother. So it's very likely she was just full on with her father. And yeah. Whew. Wow. Yep. Wow. Well, I hope she's able to move forward and put a good life together for herself. Man, that is just a horrible, horrible start. Um, I mean, to to a life. I don't mean yeah. to the show. I think that was actually a really good story. I didn't expect it to go so dark. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, that is oh, yeah. that is really a dark one. Um, all right. Well, I think it's time to follow that up with my story. Um, this is one that I like to call the mother of all disorderly dads. I don't know, though. You might give this guy a run for his money with your story. That was just such a wicked, twisted thing. Mm -hmm. um, but let's, let's let's see if I can top you here. I've got faith. <laughs> the Bureau of Justice Statistics, the research arm of the Justice Department, estimates that there are 1.7 million children with a parent in prison on any given day. According to a study at UC Berkeley, children of criminal parents had a 2.4 times higher chance of becoming criminals themselves. Some statistics suggest that 5% of families in the world account for nearly 50% of all crimes. That's an insane statistic. Isn't that? It's I mean, it's hard to swallow. Like, I want to believe that, but it seems so impossible. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting when you start looking at, you know, kids that have parents in jail, 2.4 higher, you know, chance yeah. of be getting into crime. So obviously it, it, there is some type of thing generationally yeah. that can happen with that. Um, there's another end to that statistics. In the United States specifically, it's estimated that 10% of families account for two-thirds of all crime committed here. Does a family Ooh. that commit crimes together stay together? When Not in my case. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. They turn their back on him quick. Yeah, absolutely. But maybe it wasn't laid in generation. Maybe you need more generations to really get that programming in there. Mm -hmm. uh, when researching today's episode, I found out about an entire family devoted to crime for several generations. The Bogle family didn't attend church, didn't get into Boy Scouts or other social groups that would provide them with outside role models. They only looked to each other and kept a very strong family bond, a bond supported by criminal acts and a hatred of the law. They bonded on being rebels and seemed like they were out to prove who was the baddest Bogle. The Bogle family has had over 60 family members arrested. That's insanity. 60 family members. And if I remember right, that's over four generations. Their criminal history started back in the 1920s and runs right up to today, covering practically every type of crime you can imagine and spanning multiple states. The Bogle family had many risk factors commonly linked to a future in crime, alcoholism, child abuse, and poverty. One of the family houses that was passed down through the generations was actually constructed from used battery crates, crates that were stained with leaking acid and emitted a toxic odor at least it kept out the roaches, the family would joke. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. It's too bad they didn't get into comedy. There's there's a couple of choice quotes that I heard from them. Um, the Bogle family would bring what I believe is the world's worst criminal father or disorderly dad into this world. Dale Vincent Bogle, also known as Rooster. He was supposedly called Rooster since infancy because he got up before the chickens wanting his bottle. Born October 12, 1941, Rooster wasn't interested in toys or sports as a boy. Rooster liked stealing things. One of five boys, Rooster and his brothers started a life of crime very early on. In one caper, three of the brothers stole a safe. With no way to open it, they tried torching it through the top. The metal melted, dripping onto the money inside the safe, burning and marking the bills with the molten metal. They tried spending it anyways. <laughs> Daniel shaking her. They head. just don't care at all. They're like, eh, it's still <laughs> yeah. maybe usable. Yeah, we're going to try, try to use it anyways. <laughs> and guess what? They were quickly arrested. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, Dang, never saw that coming. Yeah, yeah. That's another thing. It's it's not that they necessarily try to be great at crimes. They just they just do it. They just do it and keep doing it and and keep going to jail. Uh, Rooster was young enough during that one that he only received probation. But at age seventeen, he'd pull another heist. In 1959, he robbed a grocery store in Amarillo, Texas. But he wasn't alone. All of his brothers, one of his sisters, and his mother were with him. Rooster. This sounds like something out of a movie. I know. I know. <laughs> it like, should this doesn't be. seem like it's real life. Yeah, it should be a movie. There is a book based on it, but yeah, n- not a movie that I've seen so far. Uh, Rooster's father and mother were also moonshiners during the era of prohibition, making and selling illegal alcohol. Back in the 30s, Rooster's mother would fake slip and falls, swindling money out of unsuspecting victims and their insurance companies. The family moved to Oregon in 1961, where Rooster would stage his own slip and fall, gaining almost $1,000 from an insurance company just for that one incident. That really puts like, mm, like mother, like son. Right, right. Just like. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, boy. Pass down that trick through the generations. Rooster married a woman named Kathy and they had some children together. At some point, Rooster also began dating a migrant worker named Linda White. He promised to marry her as well, but instead just moved her in to his and Kathy's home. Kathy didn't seem to mind, once stating to Linda, that way I'll see more of Rooster because he won't be out so much at night chasing after you. Yeah, and there's actually a picture of them uh, all sitting together. All three? (laughs) Yeah, with him in the middle. And I don't remember if they're holding each other's hands in his lap or he's holding one of their hands each or something, but yeah, they're. Oh my gosh. Yeah, they're they're all happy together. Uh, Rooster would have six sons and three daughters with the two women. He would tell his children that they were gypsies whose ancestors escaped from Germany and that their inheritance was to live by stealing. Every one of his children wound up spending time in jail and it wasn't hard to understand why. Rooster taught his oldest son, Tony, how to steal bikes and where to fence them at the young age of six. In 1969, his four-year-old son, Bobby Bogle, got a very interesting Christmas present. Under the likely stolen Christmas tree was a simple brown paper bag. In the bag was a large wrench. Rooster wasn't giving Bobby what he wanted. He was giving Bobby a way to get whatever he wanted. Bobby and his brothers used the wrench later that Christmas day, breaking into a local grocery store and stealing a case of Coca-Cola. Yeah, that's my sons, said Rooster through a grin when he was told what the boys had done. I mean, talk about really manipulating kids into thinking their only way is this way. Yeah. And like teaching them nothing different. Oh my goodness. Yeah, absolutely. And he's so proud of it. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But he's also, you know, second generation at this point. I mean, his he learned his slip that, and fall from yeah. his mother. So, yeah. That's all there is. Yeah. Rooster would get his sons drinking around the age of six or seven. And around 11 or 12, they would accompany him to pick up on women and watch their father's relations with prostitutes. So, yeah, he's got his two women at home, but he's still going out and he's taking the boys with him when he's when he's going to find prostitutes. Kathy wasn't much better as a mother. When Bobby turned 16, she took him to a strip club. Bobby was shocked when the star dancer took the stage. It was his sister, Melody. That's your birthday present, exclaimed his mother. Oh, boy. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, boy. (laughs) Yeah. And I've read a few different versions of this. In the first one, it was kind of like, oh, they were both surprised when Melody took the stage. And it's like, oh, my God, that's the sister. In the other versions, it's like the mom actually planned this. She's like, yeah, I know. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. The star. Give it the program. The star is your sister, Melody. Rooster's oldest son, Tony, who is now incarcerated on a murder charge, said back when he was a teenager, his father would sometimes drive him past the Oregon State Correctional Institution and say, you'll soon be there, son, with a proud smile on his face. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, there's this weird culture of just like one upsmanship that is going on in this family. And uh, once again, I've heard several different variations on this. Other brothers that, you know, he would do the same thing. He'd drive them by, look in there, look in there someday. It's going to be like, your home. I would do that while passing like my child's future high school or, or college, you know. maybe. Or, yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but they're like, look, son, you see that prison? Yeah. That's your that's your goal. You're going to be got there. This. <laughs> Someday just like daddy you're going to be there. 
The Bogle boys constantly broke the law and didn't have to worry about their parents being upset. It was much more likely that their parents would be proud. Another of Rooster's sons, Tracy, who had been jailed for kidnapping and assault, said, If I'd been raised in a family of doctors, I'd probably be a doctor. But I was raised in my family of outlaws who hated the law. One of Tracy's happiest memories was breaking into a bar, emptying out the cash register, going home and waking up his mother by dumping a sack of bills on her face. He said she literally shrieked with joy. John, this is a mess. Isn't it? It's like Like, Ma Duncan was wild, but I think you're like taking this. You're taking this home because this whole family. Yeah. Yeah. But. It's it's the whole family and Rooster is part of the family. So that's where I don't I don't know. Your story is very much about one bad person who's a father. This is about a father that admittedly is raising thieves. <laughs> a whole bunch of them. A whole bunch. And they're continuing. And a murderer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And a murderer. Uh, there was, I mean, honestly, they've, they've got charges all over the place. I didn't even want to bring in some of the charges because they're so gnarly. But uh, yeah. Tracy also recalls memories with his father. He took us out with him to burglarize our neighbors. Uh, they would steal their cows and chickens or take their social security checks right out of their mailboxes. We did it all as a family. We had pride in our family doing these robberies, so it was fun. We were a crime family. The Bogle children would steal lumber from the lumber yard and resell it. And when some of them were in middle school, they even stole big rigs. The kids were hardly big enough to reach the pedals of the semi and see over the steering wheel. The brothers once ran a semi through the wall of a gun store so they could steal all the guns. Tracy says they must have stolen 300 semis in total. That's terrifying. That's a lot of guns. Isn't that crazy? Oh, well, no, I'm lot. talking about trucks. They sold oh, 300 oh, oh, trucks. Oh, I thought you were like semi-automatic guns when they went through the gun store. For the guns, That's where my brain was going. <laughs> well, I'm sure. I mean, they at least stole dozens of guns if they broke into the side of okay. a gun store. But yeah. That makes it even crazier, though, because yeah. That's what <laughs> I mean. 300 semi-trucks. Semi-trucks. 300 that they stole in total. Uh, in one bizarre caper, the family tried to have their teenage son marry a police detective's underage daughter. They forged birth certificates for both of them and made their teenage son wear a fake mustache. I wonder how believable it looked. I'm honestly very curious. I wish I had a picture of this. I know. I wish I had more details. Unfortunately, I couldn't find more details on that particular aspect. But it did remind me of Ma Duncan and uh, her yep. trying to get the divorce for her yep. son by faking being his wife. Mm -hmm. The family's love of crime is obvious in many ways. One of Rooster's daughters, who would serve time for child endangerment and manufacturing drugs, fell in love with a man named Jesse James. <laughs> Their children have charges from assault and robbery to attempted strangulation of a spouse. There are a few bright spots in this family. One niece of Rooster's named Tammy Bogle Stuckey has never been arrested and never abused drugs. She has gone through two abusive marriages, but is now running five halfway houses for stepping out ministry. They regularly take care of 45 recently released inmates. It seems perfectly normal, she says, of her work caring for paroled prisoners. They're just like my family. And in some cases, that is literally the truth. At least three Bogles have lived in the halfway houses under Tammy's supervision, including her own son. So even oh, though, wow. she, yeah, even though she straightened out, her son is still basically in and out of jail. And in one particular instance, um, I heard that uh, she was happy that he was back in jail because she knew that he was actually safer there than when yeah. he was out, you know, doing drugs and crime. Another bright spot in Rooster's family tree is a granddaughter named Ashley. She is working hard to break the family cycle. Her mother's side of the family includes a policeman, a prison guard, and a nurse, which likely gave Ashley role models of a different kind than most Bogle offspring had. In 2016, Ashley became the first college graduate in 150 years of Bogle family history, earning her associate's degree. She now works as a medical records technician at a hospital. Her daily commute takes her past a prison where many of her family members have been locked up. I don't think about it honestly. I just figure that everybody in the family has the opportunity to make their own choices, Ashley says. In a family where crime is the norm, 
Ashley and Tammy seem to be the true rebels. After a lifetime of robbery, insurance fraud, domestic abuse, and raising a family of criminals, Rooster Bogle died in 1998 at the age of 57 of natural causes. If you'd like to learn more about the Bogle family, please check out In My Father's House, A New View of How Crime Runs in the Family by Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Fox Butterfield. In an article published in The Atlantic, Fox Butterfield states, when you come to realize the importance of family and crime, the $182 billion a year U.S. criminal justice system seems fundamentally misguided. Mass incarcer incarceration has created a giant churn. The more people we lock up now, the more people we will have to lock up in the future. And I want to give a quick thank you to The Guardian, The Telegraph, The Atlantic, as well as The New York Times Post and Daily News for providing information for all of this. I'm actually physically tired after hearing that story. <laughs> wow. That was emotionally draining. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot to take in with that one. You've got so many, and I'm telling you, I thinned this down. There are There was more details about all kinds of different crimes to go into. Oh, I can only imagine with that many people. Yeah. You know, and what's so sad is the one quote where she said that, you know, everyone in the family had a choice yeah. to do something different. And, you know... <sighs> He had a choice when he got married and when he had six children, he could have changed things. And it just, it's almost scary that the one big difference for, I can't remember the granddaughter's name, was that she had, you know, the doctor, the nurse. Ashley, yeah. Or the police officer and the nurse. You know, it's crazy that that's all it really might have taken mm -hmm. to throw a wrench in a cycle that had gone generations, at least for her. And, you know... Oh, man. It yeah. really shows how important it is to be around good role models. and Definitely. Definitely. And, and just there's this kind of almost like a mass psychosis situation that's going on within the family where their norm for being in that family is to be criminals and to want to be outside of law and outside of, you know, what, what the rest of us respect in terms of our boundaries for each other. I mean, they're stealing from their neighbors. Exactly. Taking social security checks means you're robbing from old people. You know, and it's, it's so scary too, because when you're t put into that sort of situation from the second you're born, obviously you can't understand for a while, but the fact that when they were six years old, right. seven years old, you know, really being pushed at that age, you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you, you have no understanding, like the impact that you're making and the consequences and that they're permanent and. You well, almost wonder I, if it's like an insecurity within exactly. themselves, like it, within Rooster, that exactly. if he would have had children that were morally straighter, let's say, than he then was. he did something wrong. Right. Then you he know, would he, look, he would have to check that within himself and say, whoa, why did I wind up like this when my children are going like that? But if he's taking them out when they're six and seven and getting them drunk and he's teaching them to steal bikes and break into places, I mean... You're just their chance to even think for themselves isn't really developed at that point. I mean, absolutely six, not. Yeah, it's completely taken away from them. Yeah. You know, as a parent myself, like even the slightest thing that I say that I feel like I said wrong or worded wrong or didn't explain right, I lose sleep over. So I can't understand the thought process of someone that you know, willingly shows their children how to break the law and is happy about it. Yeah. And and then you get their hands a, dirty too. That's exactly. almost, that's something similar between both of our stories is then you make them feel guilty for what they've done, even though they might've been led to that action, you know, by the father. Oh, absolutely. So they're not going to try to come and straighten it out now because that's going to be a really hard, bad feeling for them to take on if they really want to look at what they've done and say, oh, I shouldn't have done that. And where do you look for that decision point when, exactly. you know, this has been going on since you're four or five or six? I mean, you can't go back all the way and say, wow, when I was three, I really should have stood up to my dad and told him this is wrong and I'm not going to do this. It's just th there is no chance that that's going to happen. So, yeah, I was um, happy to find the bright spots, happy to find out about Tammy and Ashley and just yeah. how they kind of. And what's cool about Tammy's story in particular is that she's still working within trying to help rehab people. And that's what I like, too. And I feel like 
you know, everyone kind of has their purpose. Yeah. And that is absolutely perfect because a lot of people, it is difficult. <laughs> it's difficult to deal with situations like that. The people that come in there, they're not always ready to form a better life and do better things. And, you know, right. having someone that's very familiar with it and can relate on a very specific level, I think that's awesome what she's doing. I, I think do it's too. so great. Yeah. She's using a lifetime of experience and generations of information to help those people. I mean, I'm sure she's got so many stories to share with them to hopefully pull them off that path, so. That didn't even seem real. I know. <laughs> I mean, I, know. It, I just I just think, I feel like nowadays it's so wild to me. I know everyone, you know, not everyone, but there are a large percent of people that commit crimes, but I could not imagine meeting an entire family. Right. Well, that's why like extended I, family. That is the craziest thing to me. Yeah. That's why I threw in the information with the stats at the start of this, just to show that, you know, there there is something to this, apparently, that there is a small number of families. Uh, I don't think this is an individual case. I think that you would look oh, no. into other families and you would see this generational hand down of, you know, my father was a drug dealer and, you know, a little, exactly. little violence on the side of that. And now I'm in the same boat. And by the way, I've got a son and guess what he's learning. Um, well, that's one of the biggest things that I noticed when I was doing my research on this is that was the hardest thing was to find just a singular father right. <laughs> you know, doing something wrong. It was always like father and son did this or father and daughter did this. Uh, I mean, yeah. Yep. Monkey see, monkey do. I guess so. I guess so. So that is the story of Rooster Bogle. Now we're going to get into some other quick, quick little quick stories that we do at the end of the show here. Um, these, at least all of mine, are coming from a little website you might have heard of. It's called Ranker.com. <laughs> and by the way, did you know that we were rated number one true crime podcast on there? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I don't know if you just heard John, but we were actually rated number one true crime <laughs> podcast on Ranker. Oh, uh, what was just that, Just in case Danielle? you missed it. What, what did um, you... <laughs> number one on Ranker, true crime podcast. That's us, oh, crime after crime. Our <laughs> listeners are awesome. I can't believe they did that. Thank you, guys. All right. So here is another interesting story about a disorderly dad. May 2016, a man wearing a number one dad t-shirt walked into a sheriff's station with his daughter to take out a protective order against his wife. While there, the officers realized that the mild-mannered Jonathan Morrow was actually wanted on charges related to drugs. When he fled the station, an officer pointed a taser at Morrow, who used his 14-year-old daughter as a human shield. And he was wearing a number one dad t-shirt? <laughs> number one dad t-shirt pulls her right in the line of fire to take the taser. Oh, good grief. <laughs> yeah, not number one dad. <laughs> no, not at all. Well, I have another family story. So as we were just talking about things that run in the family, I think this family might might be off to their generational start of crime sprees. Uh oh. Oh yeah. So the Perry family. Oh, I thought you were going to say the Hallens. No. Uh, no, no okay. not me. I'm, at least I'm not ready to admit it yet. Um, <laughs> But the Perry family, which consisted of a father, mother, three sons, and a daughter, caused an absolute uproar at Kenobi. I could completely be wrong pronouncing that, but Kenobi State Park in New Hampshire. The family showed up for what was supposed to be a great day at a lake park, only to be told that they had to give up their pocket knives that every single one of them had strapped to their belts. So instead of handing them over and, you know, or talking, taking them back to their car, calmly talking to the authorities, the full family burst out into hysterics. They were yelling at security guards. They were causing a huge scene in front of visitors and other children waiting to get into the park. When the officers arrived on scene, the situation only worsened. Um, they put one of the sons in handcuffs, and apparently that turned everything into a full-on brawl. The members of the family proceeded to jump on the officers' backs. They were biting them, kicking them, punching them, trying to grab for the officers' guns. Um, once the backup officers arrived to help settle the situation, the mother ended up screaming and faking a seizure to try and draw attention away from her brawling sons and husband. This didn't work. They were all arrested. Thankfully. Wow. I'm telling you, it's another Bogle family. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. Perrys are coming. I mean, the entire family over pocket knives. That's crazy. It's so crazy. They were ready 
to grab an officer's gun wow. over that. Wow. Yeah, just brawling with them like that. I just, why would you risk your lives like that? Things can turn so quick in situations like that. And all of a sudden, hey, officer feels threatened, weapons pulled, yep. and something really, really bad can happen. Exactly. Uh, and how can you say that they shouldn't feel threatened? You've got the whole family with knives and jumping on people's backs. I'm, I'm really happy that didn't have a far worse outcome. Oh, yeah. Maybe they had a nice dinner all together in, in a jail cell that night, or at least Probably. a holding tank. Wow. See here, son, this is our future. I'm telling you, it's yeah, the next yeah. local family. Yeah. We're going to spend a night there. We'll only be there a couple nights, but someday you might be here for a year or more. Oh, man. Uh, a father trying to sell his car on eBay apparently decided to get creative with his ads in 2012 to see if it might help with the sale. In the pictures he posted, he had a half-naked woman pose with the car in order to garner more attention. As you might guess, the ploy worked. The car sold for $7,500. People started to question the man's methods, wondering who the half-naked woman in the photos was. At one point, the man revealed it was his daughter, but later claimed, no, it was actually a friend. Oh, boy. <laughs> Yeah. So why was the daughter okay with this? I was she given a choice? Know. Was it another probably one of those not. situations? Yeah. Oh, probably not. That's petrifying. Yes. You know, I question my decisions as a parent on a daily basis, but these past two episodes have me feeling really great about myself. Hey, I hope more, more people are feeling <laughs> great. Yeah. If you're not tr uh, raising your kids to use wrenches to break into grocery stores and steal cases of Coke, you're doing pretty good. Way to go, guys. Yeah. We're all in this together. We're doing a good job. Pat yourselves on the back. <laughs> this next one is kind of on a lighter note. Uh, Brian Olmstead. Hold he on, hold on. Brighter than a lighter note than putting my daughter on a car half naked. <laughs> <laughs> We're I can't believe it. Back and forth. Yeah. Uh, to me, this one was just so silly because it was so unnecessary. And uh, anyways, <laughs> Brian Olmstead was visiting Disney with his family for his daughter's competition. I think it was either a dance competition or gymnastics. And the day this competition started, he was left in charge of their youngest child, who I think was between one and two. They were at a Disney resort, and he proceeded to get very intoxicated at the hotel pool bar. Uh -oh. Now, there were a lot of people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And he began using the stroller to ram through crowds, like was just beelining it through crowds of people at the pool, screaming shoving people out of the way with a stroller. He was asked to go to his room multiple times for creating a scene. He wouldn't go. He was finally escorted back up only to come right back down with this kid in his stroller to create more chaos. He eventually ended up being arrested for disorderly conduct. And the whole time he was in the cop car, he was screaming that President Trump was trying to kill him. And his family later stated that he was going to get help for his drinking problem. <laughs> That this wasn't a common thing for him to scream around resorts, drinking, using a stroller as a weapon. But hopefully, hopefully he's doing better today. Oh, man. Was he trying to give his kid a ride? Because I remember when I had a younger brother and sister in the stroller, you know, I'd kind of be like, it's a roller coaster, you know, run him around and kind of turn it up on its side or something. But uh, no, I don't no, think so. No, he was he on was his mad. own ride. He, oh, yeah. He was very mad about these crowds. You know, I mean, Disney can get a little bit crazy. And especially if there's a competition going on, all those hotels fill up real quick. Mm -hmm. Lots of people. Yeah. So he was just he was not happy. Wow. Well, I'll have to remember his excuse. I think that's a pretty good excuse. If I'm ever arrested, I'll have to yell, Trump, Trump's trying to kill me. He's trying to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> wow. All right. One more for you guys. In October of 2011, Sean Weimer of Detroit used his nine-year-old daughter to drive him to the convenience store in the middle of the night because he also was intoxicated. He bragged to the gas store clerk about how he got his kid to drive him there and even rewarded her with a candy apple. So, Danielle. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <clears throat> Did you know that you've got designated drivers built into your family? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. And, you know, actually, I stumbled across a story just like that of someone who lives probably like one town over from me. Um, he used his eight-year-old son, I believe to drive him home because he was drunk. Wow. Did that kid get a candy apple? Uh, nope. The kid didn't get a single oh, thing. Oh, no. <laughs> Terrible. 
<laughs> oh, man. Oh, yeah. I don't know what's worse. I mean, can you imagine what would have happened if she got in an accident? She's freaking nine years old. You know, I understand kind of the thought process of thinking, oh, well, they're not drunk and I am. So maybe this is a smarter option. But then you have to, you know, be an right. adult and realize, hey, I'm talking about a nine year old. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Probably wow. not a good decision. <laughs> yeah. If you're that drunk, you don't need to go to the store. Just <clears throat> exactly. stay at home. Or there's things like Ubers and Lyft. You yeah. Know, if, you, if you're like desperate to get out, use one of those, not your child. Yeah, it's absolutely. frowned upon. <laughs> <laughs> Although Uber and Lyft is much more expensive than a candy apple, so I, I get it. Very true, but I will say <laughs> my Uber one time came with a lollipop. So oh, that's true. Yeah, I do get candy in there with sometimes. Two birds one stone. Sometimes. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> All right, who do you think is going to win this month? I want your opinions, John, before we ask the audience. Hmm. I'm still caught up on having. Mine is about a family of criminals and yours is very much focused on what the father did to, to make that work. So in terms of focus, I think your story is stronger just in terms of sheer shock because there's so many participants in mine. I think it, it's just different. That and if you think about it, yours isn't really just one dad. It's dad after dad after dad. So technically you hit it nail on the head with like a whole bunch of dads. <laughs> well, you can see that either way. Yeah. Either we're talking about well, hold on, was it was the episode titled Disorderly Dads, plural? <laughs> Maybe. Or was John, it just I think disorderly just dad? Disorderly yep, you, dads. You talked plural. me into it. There is an S there, disorderly dads. I don't know. It was a very, it was much more difficult topic than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. You know, it, it was a bunch of very short, quick snippets. So it was very yeah. difficult to find my story. And, you know, I didn't stumble into John's story until I was much deeper in my research. So I feel like it was actually a lot harder. And I think we both did a really great job. Yeah. I think we both hit it on the head about dads that are just absolutely wild. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, I think it came out good. I think it was worth worth the hard work. It was. It was hard work. I don't even remember how I got to my story. I was just, I like, I blacked out and I came back <laughs> and all of a sudden I had the story. Like I just, I, I don't, Sometimes I get into such a weird thing when I'm searching. I just don't even remember where I was going. And I just well, I wound up on the Bogles. Oh, yeah. You start with like one search term and somehow it turns into something. In t I mean, like totally off the wall. Yeah. Entirely different. But I don't know. You guys let us know. Right now, up in the upper hand corner, there will be a little eye. Who do you think had the best story about a disorderly dad? And keeping with the trend that we've been seeing over the past few months, we've got another holiday coming up in July. Danielle, did you know we have a, um, a holiday? Yeah, yep, it's coming. Mm -hmm. Fourth of July. Fourth of July. So for next month's episode, we are doing stolen on the fourth of July. Basically robberies that have something to do or occurred on the fourth of July. Sound good, Danielle? <laughs> I'm excited, a little bit nervous. I'm traumatized by this this month's research process <laughs> that I went through. You guys don't know, John knows I'm traumatized, but I've, I've got faith. We've it's got an this. easy research job for me. I'm just gonna reach out to the Bogle family and say, hey, what'd you guys do last 4th of July? <laughs> <laughs> Not if I message them first. Uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> Excuse I, me. Hi. Uh. <laughs> yeah, I gave away my research tips. <laughs> all right. Now, you guys can find us on all of our other social media platforms. I have my personal YouTube channel, which is Danielle Hallen. And you can also find me on Twitter at Danielle Hallen. I think YT at the end of it. Honestly, I forget all the time. It's either Daniel Hallen YT or just Daniel Hallen. Yep. And you can find me at the Lord and Arts channel, L-O-R-D-A-N-A-R-T-S or on Twitter at Lord and Arts. If you have ideas to submit for future episodes of Crime After Crime, please email us at crimeaftercrime at lordandarts.com. Or you can also reach out to us on Twitter at crimeafterpod. Crime After Crime is produced and hosted by Danielle Hallen and John Lorden. And we want to take a moment to thank our patrons. You guys keep the limited ads on YouTube and no ads on audio. Plus, you guys get a free bonus Patreon special segment monthly. And the one John and I just recorded, 
It's a very interesting topic. Plus, every time someone joins, they get a personal shout out in one of our Patreon specials. We butcher your names. It'll be fine. Just correct us, but it's still a good <laughs> yeah, time. We all have fun with it. <laughs> if you enjoyed today's episode, please rate or review us on whichever platform you found us on. We still need help growing. I want to see another double happen on the numbers. We cannot do that without your help. And thank you for helping us get this far. And do not forget as well that we also have a merch store. You guys can check that out at teespring.com forward slash stores forward slash crime after crime. Happy Father's Day, you guys. And we will see you guys next time on Crime After Crime. Take care. Bye.